Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 121. Mm-hmm. Oh. I told you, no, numbers, 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 no, no, no. None no, it's the Roaring Twenties, Nick. We're roaring. into the Roaring Twenties. There's fringe oh, as far as the eye can see. Fringes, fringes, can't say anything, just fringes. There's flappers and cowboys. And we're charlestoning all over the place. <laughs> I, can you imagine the fringe flaying as you Charleston? Oh, imagine the oh, imagine the devastation you would cause as you go by people. <laughs> my eye, my <laughs> like, god, my eye! Like a whirling dervish, just <laughs> like one of those grass trimmers, just like cutting people down as you <laughs> Charleston by them. Or like a very, very budget car wash. <laughs> Depends how many bees you had. You see, that no one talks about this from the 20s. No one talks about the injuries that were incurred <laughs> in the Charleston competitions. How are you, Nick? Am I? Are you okay? Uh, You're on tenterhooks, aren't oh, you? I got, I got, I got a whole week off. Luxury. This is nothing to anyone who's listening. But nah, to you, it's, it's everything. Just, oh, it's, it's everything. It should be everything to everyone. I've got a week off. Can we come around? No. <laughs> no. No one can come around. I'm not seeing anyone. I'm not leaving the house. Bolting the doors. Barring the windows. Until you ring me and say, I forgot to get supplies. Yeah. Bring things to bring, me. Bring me cake and another <laughs> bottle of gin, then go away. Do you remember when we were young and we were like, oh, week off, I'm going to go, I'm going to spend a weekend in Palmer and then I'm going to go out clubbing and I'm going to explore all these things and I might go here, I might go there. Now it's like, I am bolting the doors I, and doing nothing. Mm, no, no, I don't. I have never done that. <laughs> I have never done that and I never will do that and I never want to do that. It sounds sh- dreadful. Sh- shut up, I'm trying to make us sound cool, man. <laughs> There's none of that. You've set your stall. I've set my stall. I'm going to be grumpy. I might go and see an exhibition in an art gallery in a sort of vaguely How novel vaguely pretentious sort of I'm going to be cultured in my week off and then sit at McDonald's I've got grand ideas I'm going to go to London <laughs> I'm going to go to the British good exhibition of the British Museum I want to see I might go Ooh. there I might walk to the V&A I like their theatre exhibition. I might go there. Because in England, you can do that. We are but an hour away in the train from some of the finest museums and theatres in the world, really. I could go up on Wednesday. I could do a matinee. But you're not going to. But I'm not going to do any of it. But I like thinking of the possibilities (laughs) if I wasn't sitting down eating snacks. You're going to swill in a groaning going, I'm so cultured just because I thought of this. I thought Mm. of these things. What What can I get delivered? I'm going, now going to watch Downton Abbey for the twelfth time. <laughs> Any poisonings this week ahead of your week off in preparation? I don't know, it could have been. I've been very busy preparing for the week off. Yes, your brain has gone. Brain, brain has been preoccupied with, <laughs> ma- well, mainly with trying to think of things of people to do when I'm not there. So oh, I can for give your them work. Lists. Yes, for your work. So I can give them lists. Do these things. These are the <laughs> things that you need to do. Yes, you do this for work. You don't do it to your friends. No, no, no. You don't <laughs> gather us at the <laughs> pub and say, "Here is a list of things I wish you to do this week." Well, I will not see you. I, I think that's a good damn good idea though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be writing notes. <laughs> right, I'm off for a week. These are the things I expect you to do while I'm off. Are they things in your memory or are they just in things my memory? That you Where want am I going? To... Well, we're not gonna see you for a week. You may as well be dead. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna. Not... <laughs> okay, not in your memory. Okay, we're not. In my in you. my honour. In your honour. In your my, name. In my name. In the name of Nick. The what name are we of being Nick. sent out to do? Ah, oh, buy me a sandwich. <laughs> There's never been a more noble quest. <laughs> Mainly it involves bringing me food. The serfs will be sent out yeah. to scuffle. And I may have drunk all the gin by then, so you better buy some more gin. Wonderful. Well, speaking of making your friends be your servants and being alone in your castle, being an ogre, apparently, I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Ah, can I get a drawbridge with Patreon money? Yes. Excellent. Along with my cannons. This is what you're paying for, people. Excellent. Oh, as you said, I live in my castle and now I want a castle. Yeah. It's not to support wonderful creative artists no. who no, are no, just no. trying to make a living and to entertain you. No, it's basically paraphernalia so Nick can fulfill his dream of being the selfish giant. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you thank the people who yes, have enabled absolutely. this. But yes, you have enabled it. So it's so all your own fault, really. Thank you very much to Janique. To Madara Hemlock. And to HLRB. Thank you so much, you delicious, Thank sexy, you. sexy subscribers. That's 346 of a cannon. Oh, do cannons come in 46? They come in 46. You've got to build them yourself. It's like those old magazines you used to get. Like, build the Death Star in six million parts. <laughs> <laughs> Only 4.99 a part. And it's like, oh, this is very expensive. <laughs> Your cannon delivery. Cannon delivery. Well, Nick, are you ready? No. To drink cocktails. And talk about poison. Oh, could do... Or <laughs> record drink some poison and talk about cocktails. Okay. Okay to both. Yes. 
Good. Whatever yes. happens, happens. Whatever happens, happens. Okay, you're open to possibilities. Should we go with the first one? Yes, let's do that. Yes. Drink cocktails, talk about poison. Marvellous. Sounds like a plan. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is Nick's story this week. But as you know, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. And it will flavour our cocktail of the week. Nick's story, so his pick. And Nick, the secret ingredient this week is... Is... It's chess. 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 Lovely intellectual ingredient. The sport of kings. No, that's horse racing. That's horse racing. What? What's chess? It's chess mainly. The, the Queen's Gambit. Uh, yes. Is a. It's a chess play thing. In the chessness of the chess, I don't know how. I to can. Ch- I can tell you know it well. I don't know how to chess. No. Right. I do not chess. I do not chess either. No, I don't. I'm, no, I did, I think, as a child. Yeah. I know the moves Badly. of the chess. Do you? I know how to play the chess, but I'm not I'm not good at the chess. So I'm not good at the strategy of the chess. Yes, it's all I, about strategy. I know which I know which bits move where and how they move. But that's about it. Yes, everyone knows that. Yes, well, indeed. Well, that's the, you can play chess. I cannot <laughs> play it well. So chess. Chess. Chess involved. Oh, interesting. And now is chess an ingredient? Interesting. I don't know. Are we going to be served up some sort of pawn in a glass? A bishop, perhaps? A bishop. A castle yes. or a rook or a knight clip clopping its way across the board? <laughs> Clippity clop. Towards your drink. Towards my drink. <laughs> to vanquish it. <laughs> what have you come up with? Oh, see, now I know you're going to shout at me again. I am probably yeah. Really gonna shout at me. What do you think? When you think about chess, what do you think about chess? I think about chess. That's what do you what think? I think no, about. what are the aspects of chess? Pieces on a board. Okay, and what about what, what's about those pieces? About that board? I think that strategy, a checkerboard. Okay, well, I'm gonna get shouted out for this one. We are having a black and white daiquiri. What? The pieces are black and white. Are you and kidding? And the board is a black and white. Are you kidding me? No. A black and white daiquiri, a black and white from, daiquiri chess. from chess. You just took chess and then you went seven stops down the train yeah. line to get to black and white. Yeah. What? Yeah. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> Is it just because you wanted to try this thing? Yeah. yeah. And then you went anything, black and white, chess. Yeah, there we are. That's exactly how it went. <laughs> Oh, I feel like there's so much has been missed out. Are there not bishop or knight or queen or king cocktails? Well, there was a, there was not really. There was a, there was a queen Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary and Queen this and, mm. and so that, that's not really chessy. No, I think checkerboard or no 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 sort of no. I didn't come up with any sort of checkerboardy one. There was a couple of bishop ones, but I wasn't particularly inspired by those. They seemed a bit meh. Oh, I thought ooh, black and white chess pieces. <sighs> it's tough because that's what I have it, so. I mean, yeah, yeah you, no you, have, you have no, you have no choice in the in the matter. So you can huff and puff all you like. I like a black and white animal, so uh, that's okay. And that's if we're going to crowbar in the tenuous references. <laughs> a zebra comes along. There's a zebra in there as well, if you want. Yay! No, it's not, I lied. Oh, boo, Nick. So chess, black and white, a black and white daiquiri. I'm intrigued. Okay, Nick, I think you should make your move <laughs> into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, yeah. black and white daiquiri. I, I, you know what? Maybe I will just push this rage down deep inside of me and move on from it. Maybe move, I'll move, move on. on. Move, move on from the rage. Yes, that, that's good practice. A black and white daiquiri. Yeah. I have notes. You always have <laughs> notes. You always have notes. It looks beautiful. It looks very smart. I'm I love it. the colour, but it's neither black nor white. Yeah, I was hoping it would be darker. Now, I'm going to venture a guess as to one of the ingredients in this. Possibly. Could you? Mainly because we went to picking for them we earlier on. We went to the shrubberies We did Canterbury. raid the shrubberies of Canterbury earlier on Nick's instruction for some blackberries. Blackberries. And they're surprisingly early in season this yeah. year. So if there's not blackberries in this, I'm not sure what you made me do out there. Yeah, I just made you run around for a bit. Well, the hilarious part of that is we went out <laughs> to the hedgerow near Nick's house right at the moment that a bunch of Cub Scouts turned yeah. up to go blackberry picking and well, I don't know if they I don't know if they were there to go blackberry picking we were the, we were there picking blackberries and like the scout or the leader chappy said oh look there's blackberries everyone come and get blackberries and we're inundated by children picking blackberries they're my fucking blackberries <laughs> either that guy stole our idea yeah. and was really flailing for things to do with those scouts he was like yes blackberry picking let's just harm the children in these brambles <laughs> or we took a lot of the blackberries those well... children were excited to pick for that day and we were there two grown adults shoving them out of the way going no, that's one mine. That's for our I, booze. I, I, think, I think we had better use of them. So, I think yeah. those kids threw them on the ground later yeah. to then go on their TikToks and their vapes. <laughs> 
old nine year olds. Yeah, they were. They, were, they were like seven. <laughs> but we have blackberries definitely in yeah. the drink. I'm not yeah. going to guess anymore. Let's uh, let's dive in, let's give it shall a go. we? Okay. It smells fruity. Merry smells fruity. Christmas. Merry Christmas indeed. Mm. Oh, that's tart. <laughs> tart as you would expect from a blackberry. <laughs> oh, you're happy. I'm you? very happy. Oh, you're very happy. I like that a lot. Oh, it's really sharp. It's good. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, oh, the flavours. <laughs> oh, there's, there's stuff going on there. The flavours are coming through, Nick. Oh, yes, I can taste the blackberries, but I can taste other things. Yeah. I I'm taste glad. good things. Good things. Good things. Well, I'm going to venture that it's a daiquiri, so it's got rum. Yep. Rum. There's a perfume to it, Nick. There's a perfume. There's a perfume that I'm intrigued by. Slightly mm. aroused. I like this. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, anything with good fresh foraged fruit in it is right up my alley. It just really taps into my witchy <laughs> shenanigans. It's a good um, summary one, that. You know what? I'm going to... What are you going to do? I'm going to offer an opinion. Okay. It's always dangerous. It's right on the line of being too flowery and too sweet. Well, you're wrong. It's on the right line, but it's reminding <laughs> me of Fruits of the Forest yogurts and Fruits of the Forest kind of ice creams. <laughs> They're good. It's not quite there, but it's right on the line. It's really reminded me of that, but it's not too sweet. So talk us through it, Nick. So yeah, so daiquiri. So yes, rum. But two types of rum. Oh, okay. We have a white rum. Yes. And then we have a coconut rum. What? Can you, can you not taste the coconut? Well, now you've said it. There's a coconut twang. Hang on a minute. It's just so sharp with the <laughs> berries. Honestly, I wouldn't I wouldn't ah. put that down to coconut. An aroma I, didn't smell smell it. coconut. I can't smell anything, you know. I can't really smell coconut. No. Or perhaps it's me because I know it's in there. But yes. I, I, in my, my brain, I can smell. So you, we've got white rum. We have a coconut rum. Yes. A first. Uh, yes. But we'll t- two firsts this week. Okay. Two firsts. We have some blackberries that we Yay. did indeed go a picking. I've uh, been all squidged in the bottom. Mm. There's some lime juice. And as you would expect in daiquiri. There's some sugar. We also have a creme de meur. A creme de meur, so blackberry liqueur. <laughs> a bra- blackberry liqueur as Yay! well. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. So I had to go out and buy a blackberry liqueur and coconut rum mm-hmm. just for this recipe. And I'm very upset by that. So now I can make brambles, which is very upsetting. Woo! Yeah, lots of new things. And I really like it. I think it's absolutely lovely. That is lovely. Hello, I'm drunk, though. That has <laughs> really suddenly hit me. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Oh no, there was a lot of alcohol at once and <laughs> it's delicious. And yes, you could drink that fast and oh, then yeah. Have another. be anyone's, <laughs> which oh. I may well be in five minutes. I think that's really, really nice. I'm really, You're really I'm happy really, by really, it. I'm really pleased with that. Mm. I have a theory about coconut rum that it always makes you giggly and smiley and happy. <laughs> I, it makes you smile and makes you giggly. Oh, everything's warm and fuzzy. Something about coconut rum, no. it does it. Some people may be vomiting in their shoes right now. <laughs> but you've got all smiley. No, I, love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's great. I, I need to give you more of these so you're less mean <laughs> to me. <laughs> you seem like the world is like your oyster now. You're going to pet kittens and puppies. <laughs> Where's the absinthe? Give me the absinthe. <laughs> yes. This bodes well for a horrible murder story. But yeah, that's that perfume after taste. With the coconut and the and the blackberry. Mm. I want another one. You really, really <laughs> like this. I don't think I've ever seen Nick like this. I, in haven't, a... I haven't finished this one, but I want another one. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a while since I've seen Nick so giggly and gleeful. <laughs> oh, I'm worried about how you're going to read the story now. <laughs> it's going to be like an episode of Jack and Ori. Isn't and it? they all died horribly. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and they skipped through the fields. Of dead people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the black and white daiquiri. Yeah. I have suppressed the rage with coconut rum that black and white chess somehow have mashed together to make this acceptable with our black and white daiquiris firmly in hand as we skip through a field of lollipops and sunshine and rainbows and blackberries and get torn to pieces, apparently. <laughs> do you have a story for us, Nick? I do most certainly have a story. Woohoo! A very exciting story. We have a mystery. A great miscarriage of justice. Ooh. And the case remains unsolved to this day. No, surely not. A case whose intricacies are still taught during police training <gasps> over 90 years later. I like it. Yes, very exciting. It is 1931. Good, I'm on board. Excellent. 1931, and we meet William Herbert Wallace and his wife, Julia. Now, William and Julia have been married around 16 years or so, and they live an entirely respectable middle-class life in Liverpool in England. Oh, in Liverpool. Oh, Liverpool. nice. We haven't been there in a while. No, indeed. William works for the Prudential Assurance Company. Oh, um, yes. As Still going a, today. Yeah, well, indeed. Absolutely. As an insurance collector. He has his, his little patch in Liverpool, and he will go around 
introducing himself to the new residents, selling his his policies, um, collecting his weekly premiums that they pay. And he is a a very nice chap by all by all accounts. And Prudential Assurance, the the company, has an outstanding reputation oh, at yes. this time. It's, it's reliable and honest. And William himself is known as an absolute gentleman around town. And everyone speak who spoke about him gives him a glowing glowing reference. Now Julia is equally as well regarded um, as her husband. She she doesn't work so. She she, um, she enjoys painting. She's a very gifted artist. For her paintings adorn the walls in their in their in their home. She's also um, a very talented pianist. And the pair are known to give little concerts to their friends oh with God, with uh, Julia on the the piano and William on the violin. William less good on the violin, but he gives it a good go. Um, <laughs> I also love the fact that Nick did a gesture for a violin, violin. that looked like a ukulele. <laughs> he could have been playing the violin nice. You never know. <laughs> yes, he wasn't very good on the violin yeah. because he was playing it like a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and Julia was really covering for it with loud piano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Neighbours who had known the Wallaces for over 10 years said they had never heard a cross word or raised voice between the couple. Hmm. Which is why what came next left many desperately shocked. On the evening of the 19th of January, 1931, uh, William went out to a meeting of the Liverpool Chess Club. Chess! Chess! Um, <laughs> he is a semi-regular member there, and that evening he is scheduled to play in, in a friendly tournament. Not overly regular, but he has been a member for there for about eight years. Mm. Sometimes he's there three or four evenings a week, and then other times he's not seen for a month. But he's known around the place. That evening, he actually very nearly decided against going. Julia was a bit poorly at the time, and he didn't want to leave his wife. But she was like, no, go, I'll be fine. Go and enjoy yourself. Go and play some chess. He and himself had only just gotten over the flu. But he's like, no, get out. Go and have a nice time. Leave me alone. That's a Um, good, healthy relationship. Absolutely. And so there he was at the club. Now, just as he is about to start his game, Samuel Beatty, the, the captain of the club, comes over to him with a note. Now, Samuel tells William that the, the club had received a phone call um, earlier that evening when he when he wasn't in. Samuel had tried to tell the caller that he didn't know when William would next next be in, um, but the man on the phone had been quite insistent about leaving leaving a message. And here he was. What a, what a bit of luck that he is actually he is there that evening. Now, the the note was from a Mr. R. M. Qualtroff. The uh, who and the what now? Mr. R. M. Qualtroff. 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 That's a Qualtroff. interesting name. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. Mr. Qualtroff, in his call, had stated that he wanted to purchase an insurance policy through William, and would William please do him the courtesy of visiting him the following evening at his home at 25 Men Love Gardens East. Okay. Men Love Gardens? Men Love Gardens. Men Love Gardens. Yeah. I'm just going to leave that there. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> It comes up a lot. <laughs> so if you're going to giggle, get it out of your system. <laughs> I mean, there's so much we could do. <laughs> this is Men Love Gardens East, by the way. Oh, East. <laughs> East. The West was a place of degradation. <laughs> now, William thought this was all very odd. He had never heard of Mr. Qualtroff before. But why... I don't think anyone has. Well, no. But why wouldn't this man contact William through the office to set up an appointment? Why risk leaving a message at his chess club? How did he know he was a member of the chess club? Oh, yes. Um, as he said, he was irregular. <laughs> he's irregular. William takes the details down, writes them in his little, his little diary, and then sits down to his game of chess, which he wins quite comfortably. Good for him. The next day, William leaves home at around 10.30am, as usual, to start his round, collecting his insurance premiums from his various customers, introducing them to new people who have moved in, and he, he visits with people, he has a nice cup of tea. He returns home around 6pm that evening, again, exactly as would be expected, and has a bite to eat with Julia just before heading out to visit the mystery Mr. Qualtroff. The, the first problem, though, was well, where was Men Love Gardens East? Now, supposedly, it is in the, the Mossley Hill area of Liverpool in towards in the south of the city. But going through the directories, he cannot find any such address. There is Men Love Avenue. Right. And off Men Love Avenue, you've got Men Love Gardens north, south and west. But no east. No east. No Men Love East. I mean, it just sounds like a made up name that you just <laughs> said. Men Love Gardens. I do, why did I say that? No. <laughs> this is very confusing. Yeah. Well, the, the address he, is, he has been given apparently does not exist. But he thinks, well, it must be around there somewhere. Perhaps it's a little street, little alleyway or something. Yes. Or it's a new build. It's not made into directories or something. So... <laughs> But it's going to be in that general area. He'll head there and he'll find out. He'll talk to someone. He'll get directions. It'll be fine. If you've got north, south and west, all you yeah. have to do is like provide process of elimination. Exactly. It's going to be in that neck of the woods, isn't it? Men love hasn't been practiced around here for <laughs> 10 years. No, I'm just looking for a street. Oh, sorry. 
William jumps on a tram and made his way down to, to Mossley Hill. He asked the tram driver if he knew of this un, unknown middle of Gardens East, or even of uh, Mr. Qualtroff, but no luck in that at all. It takes him three trams, three changes of trams to get to the area, and he gets off, no one knowing anything about this this Gardens East address. Is he uh, asking everyone on he's the asking tram? Everyone. Yeah, absolutely, he's asking all, he's three different tram drivers, he's asking them all, do you know where this Can address you know this, is? Yeah. Can you let me know where I should get off of this address? It's not an area he knew particularly well. Okay. Everyone said, no, sorry, Gov, I don't know about it, but it's probably going to be around there somewhere. So he gets off in the area he assumes it to be. There is still, But there is still no sign. He walks up and down a bit, can't find anything. He asks a local news agent. No, sorry, don't know anything. He finds a police officer and asks a police officer mm. uh, for help in locating this address. He cannot help either. As far as he knows, there is no such address. It's a ghost address. It's a ghost address. What he does do, he goes to 25 Men Love Gardens West. Well, thinking perhaps there's been a, a mistake in the the, the the hearing of the message. Yeah, in the trans- West, East, uh, East West, something like that. So he goes there. But the occupant, of Miss Mather, has, has never heard of a Mr. Qualtroff. No, there's no one here of that name. Hmm. Never has been. I've been here for years. Not a clue. Mr. Qualtroff's been dead for 10 <laughs> years. He wanders around a bit more. Apparently, the North and South Streets only have even numbers. So there's no 25 on them at all. So he is entirely perplexed about what what is going on with this. Okay. After 45 minutes to an hour of, of wandering the streets, searching, William says, I'll bugger this. And he decides, <laughs> to, he decides to head home. We shouldn't have to say it. But oh, the dark, dark days before Google Maps. Yeah, it's like no Google Maps, no mobile. No, no mobile, can't, can't just give him, give him a call and say, where are you, mate? And if um, your job is to go door to door to make your living, to get your wages, then you are going to spend the time doing well, this. Well, exactly. He, if, he sells a, if he sells a policy, he's going to get a commission out of it. Ooh. So it's not, not an opportunity he can pass up. Indeed. But he has had no luck. So he decides, right, enough's enough. Off I go. It's around 8.40 by the time William actually gets home, 8.40 in the evening. And he's really rather frustrated by this sort of wasted journey. As he goes to open the front door, he finds it locked. It's bolted from the inside. Now, this is quite unusual. Julia knew that even if she'd gone to bed, she knew that he was coming back at some point. He tries knocking, but there was no answer. As I say, he assumes that Julia must have had an early night. Just done it automatically and forgotten. So he goes to the back door. Again, door is locked. As he is knocking on the back door, trying to rouse his wife, who, is assumed, who he assumes has gone gone to bed, uh, he sees his neighbours, uh, John and Florence Johnston, walking along the back path on their way out. William stops them and asks if they had heard anything unusual that evening. He explains that he can't get back into the house again and Julia wasn't answering. And he was starting to get a bit worried about yeah. what was what was going on. Now, John replies that they've not heard anything. They've been in all evening. They're only just leaving now. They've not heard anything odd. They've not seen anything odd. He suggests that William tries the back door again. If no luck, he's got a spare key. John John has got a spare key. If it's stuck, you'll go and get the key and see what they can do. That's that's shit advice as well. Like, I've got a spare key, but try it again. Try it again. Well, I'm he's, sure he's... you weren't turning your own door <laughs> handle properly. Well, he tries it again. The door opens. Oh, God, that was good advice. <laughs> no one listened to me. Yeah. No, what, why does it open? What, why I don't like it? this. Why does it open? The door opens without complaint, without a fuss. Door swings open. What? The Johnsons wait outside. William goes in to make sure everything is as it should be. Everything's okay. Julia's tucked up in bed, completely oblivious. So they all is well. They've seen him open the door. They've seen him open the door. They're they're now standing in his back garden, and Mm -hmm. so yeah, they've seen him. The door's open, and they they will wait outside. You go. Just give us a yell that everything's okay and we'll carry on and blah, blah, all shall be well. John remembered he could he could hear William calling out for, for Julia in the house asking if she was okay, but there was no response. He also remembers that he could see the lights go on in the house as he was going room to room, turning lights on, lighting batteries to get the gas yeah. going. As William pushes the parlour door open, he sees Julia lying on the floor. Now in the dark, his initial thought was she's taken a fall, she's, she's had a seizure or she's had a fit or something and, and collapsed he rushes to the other side of the room where the gas tap is to 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 light gas lighting and as the room fills with light william to his horror sees julia her skull smashed open (gasps) and blood and brains oozing out all over the floor he he cries out in in horror at what he's seen and and john johnson who's been waiting outside comes rushing in to see what what's going on confronted by this gruesome scene in the parlor john ushers 
William out of the room and tells him and his wife not to touch anything and he legs it out of the house to go and find a police officer go and go and alert the authorities about what what's happened William and Florence settle in the kitchen while they wait for the arrival of the authorities in the kitchen Florence notices that a cabinet door is broken on the floor and she points it out to William tells her that that is where he keeps his insurance collection tin so the money he has collected during the day is usually kept in in that cupboard and going to look he finds the tin empty John Johnston reappears saying that the police are on their way. They've been told to wait. Florence explains about the missing money and, and the damaged cabinet and John urges William to go and look around the rest of the house. Is anything else out of place? And Is anything else missing? William does so. He's sort of in a bit of a daze and he, he does what does what he's told and he goes upstairs and he, he returns saying the way everything seems to be in order. There, there's a few pounds in a, in a pot that was there. The money's still there. Nothing's been gone through and rifled through. It doesn't look like anything has been touched. The first on the scene is a constable Williams who takes one look in the pile and goes nope um, <laughs> <laughs> think it's probably best to wait to the superiors to get here for that one. <laughs> oh bless constable williams yep. he was probably rocking up going don't worry i'm made of sterner stuff boys and let me handle this okay <laughs> yeah. pretty much exactly how it is and he goes <laughs> like his superiors turn up and go you didn't let him in there did yeah. you god <laughs> This is your last warning about throwing up all over crime scenes. So instead, the constable uh, takes William around the house to see what's what. And William points out the broken cabinet in the kitchen, the missing insurance money. Mm. And then up in the bedroom where money has been left in, in the pot. But the rest of the house seems entirely undisturbed, really. Mm. Just that one room, the parlour and the kitchen soon there is a host of police officers doctors forensic specialists everyone is descended upon the house the parlor is searched through rummaged through and again nothing seems to be missing really nothing is out of place at all the, the attack must have been so so swift and brutal that there was no time for a, for a fight or any resistance there was nothing overturned or anything like that blood spatter arcs seven foot up the walls covering paintings and photographs the only one slightly unusual thing was that julia's body was lying on top of a macintosh coat an outdoor really? jacket she wasn't she wasn't wearing it but she was like lying on top of it hmm. so they think well perhaps she had been carrying it when she was attacked and fell onto it maybe perhaps she had been had weird. had come in uh, carrying the coat or was mm. just about to go out with the coat or was just moving the coat around the house and <laughs> had been <laughs> had been surprised. but she was lying on on an outdoor coat which was something unusual a post-mortem examination of julia revealed that she had received 11 vicious strikes to the head um with a with a blunt object and the blows had been strong enough to crush crush her oh, skull frenzied attack F- absolutely then. frenzy say blood all up the walls swinging around the place yeah. so really yeah. violent really frenzied you're making sure she's dead you're not just knocking her out absolutely now investigators waste no time at all in making william herbert wallace the number one suspect husband he must have done it from the very outset they are convinced that he is responsible. On one hand, closest to home, we've seen it many times. Oh, absolutely. Husband, you must have done it. That's convenient. But also, mm. yeah, no, they are they are exactly that frame of mind. They it must the husband must have, must have done it for some reason that we don't know yet. But the husband must have done it. Yes, yeah, so the law of averages says yeah, but, it's going to be someone you know. Well, quite. William tries to explain that he's been out of the house all evening. He's been on the hunt for this elusive Mister Qualtroff. He couldn't have and had no reason for killing his wife but, but the police are adamant no it's you it was definitely 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 you <laughs> um they believe that the appointment with mr Qualtra was just a ruse yeah. a flimsy alibi that williams he must have given himself he must have provided himself the police in fact confirm that there was no men love gardens east it does not exist it never has existed ever in liverpool there is no mr Qualtroff either no there is no such man in all of liverpool i think we all knew that <laughs> but now it is confirmed and they are sure that this has been a scam. Now, William explained about that the message had been received at the chess club. And using this detail, the police were able to ascertain that the call to the club requesting this this appointment had been made from a phone box just 400 yards from the Wallace house. <gasps> William must have left the message himself, they think. Really? To give himself an alibi. I mean, it's a it's one very good theory. <laughs> it's it's the very theory. split down the middle it's, right now. It's the theory they went with. This, 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 this. They had no other theories in mind. He gives himself an alibi. He leaves a message. He turns up at his club, and someone, like, oh yeah, oh okay, I've got this message. I'll mm. go out and see these people. It's, I mean, it's clever. It's clever, but 
but, but, but. But, 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 but. There are witnesses to William being miles and miles and miles away that mm. evening, the other side of the other side of town. He's ridden three different trams to get to Mossley Hill. He's bought tickets from all these tram drivers, and then in his search for Men Loves Gardens East, he has spoken to a residence, he's spoken to a news agency, he's spoken to a police officer. Yeah. All these people who confirmed they had indeed spoken to William Wallace on the other side of town that evening. Okay. You don't sound convinced by this. My question would be, what was the time of death? Uh If you want to give yourself an (laughs) alibi, don't you want to make yourself very, very publicly seen and known in the place where the murder is not happening? Well, that's exactly what seems to have been happening. A slight spanner in the works was thrown into the, the police theory they find a, a, a milk delivery boy um alan close he alan come, for a boy alan for <laughs> alan yeah alan for a boy he comes forward to say that he had actually seen julia and spoken to her alive and well when he delivered the milk that evening around six forty-five. okay quarter to seven that evening on the day of the murder right now as the police dig deeper into this timeline as as you suggest they find that the earliest confirmed sighting of william anywhere outside the house is on the tram the second tram driver there remembers him well and that was about five past seven so it's impossible so julia was seen alive at 6 45 was swiftly murdered by her husband who got two trams across liverpool to mosley hill all within 20 minutes no now the walk from the wallace house to the nearest tram stop was alone was about four minutes not a problem the police said not a problem at all what we can it can easily be done easily be done and they went on to prove it they found the fittest most athletic police officer (laughs) um throughout (laughs) liverpool (laughs) who wasn't Um, even a police officer they just drafted (laughs) in a cross-country runner yeah and they gave him the task of recreating this this route and to be fair to the man he he did it (laughs) for four minutes they allowed a few minutes to hypothetically bludgeon his wife stage a robbery and clean himself up the officer then sprinted out of the wallace house and jumped on a moving tram um, which had just taken off from the stop that's fine proof it could be done this young 20 year old can do it <laughs> 52 year old william wallace who had just got over the flu yeah it wouldn't mean a problem for him he could he could have recreated this athletic feat not a problem at all and being completely <laughs> nonplussed everyone who saw him said oh he looks like he was just bumbling around the place he wasn't out of breath or yeah. disheveled or anything like that completely normal completely normal they probably made the young athletic cop kill someone as well to really <laughs> do it i don't want to yeah. no, no no we need the adrenaline up so you'll run faster yeah but uh, they were convinced that william could have done it in the same timing as this 20 year old oh, officer they are entirely unmoved by arguments um against the, their case and two weeks after julia's death william wallace is charged with her murder. Okay, this feels like a good place to get another drink to steady our nerves. It's humid, sweaty, and sticky. Summer can be really uncomfortable. But we're actually talking about your mattress. Don't worry, though. Nectar's Nectar Tech cooling technology helps you sleep cool on hot summer nights. Plus, every mattress includes a one-year trial, forever warranty, and free shipping. With $200 off, prices start at only $399. And get $499 of premium accessories, including pillows, sheets, and a mattress protector this summer. So chill out and visit Nectarsleep.com. In front of the jury, the prosecution claimed that on the 19th of January, William Wallace had placed the call to the chess club himself. Mm -hmm. He had disguised his voice to leave the message from the the made-up Mr. Qualtroff. How else, the police claim, would the caller possibly know that William was going to be in that evening? He was a very hit and miss visitor but obviously someone knew that he was going to be there who else would know but William himself then the next day William said his goodbyes to Julia and then he waited he hid around the corner and waited for milk boy Alan Close to arrive to provide that witness statement that Julia was alive and well at 6.45 he needed someone to have seen her alive and as soon as Alan had completed his delivery William re-entered the house where he stripped off his, his clothing put on a Macintosh and then naked underneath his Macintosh moved towards the parlour where he bashed Julia to death apparently with the fire poker which was found to be missing from the house (sighs) now the the Mac had taken most of the the inevitable spatter and blood and gore and everything um, that was going on so Williams then stripped off the Mac and rolled Julia's body on top of it Mm. now the theory was perhaps he was going to try and move her try and drag her away at all using the mac but whatever didn't happen it was just left there he then gets himself cleared up gets dressed calmly takes a stroll to the tram stop to start his journey creating his alibi experts 
refute this entirely. <laughs> <laughs> While this may be a plausible sequence of events, it would have taken considerably longer yeah. than the time he had to do this. The police had allowed two or three minutes to get into the house, murder his wife, what? clean him, stage a robbery, clean himself up, yeah. and get out of the house. That does not happen in two minutes. No, no. That does not happen. But the police said, yeah, he's fine. He could have done it. He could have done it. It's Absolutely. possible. Oh, it's like cereal, this. <laughs> the chess club captain, Samuel, also testifies that the voice on the phone, it's not William. There's no electronic disguising. It was a man going, hello, it's me. I'm not, I'm not William. <laughs> it's not, it was not William on the phone. He knew William's voice. And if someone um, else was going, hello, it's me, like they, yeah, what's wrong with your voice? Yeah. The first thing that you would say is like, well, it was a man who was covering his face yeah. and yeah. a robot called me. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he did a really weird Scottish-Irish accent mix. Well, it wasn't William, it was a madman. William Wallace had planned and brutally murdered his wife. How? Why? And doesn't matter. Why? Why? Doesn't matter. He did it. He why? did it. He's a husband. He did it. It was him. The jury agreed. What? Less than an hour of deliberation. <gasps> that was sandwiches. Guilty. William Wallace will hang for the murder of his wife. Good Lord. Now, the defence are slightly... What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> this was not how they thought this was going. This was how, There is no evidence. This is all bollocks. This is circumstantial. This is so circumstantial. And so we've got experts saying he could not possibly have done it in this time frame. No. It, it, your story just does not add up. But no, it was him. Emotive. It was him. They even looked at the, the insurance. Julia was insured for about £20. Less than William had in his bank yeah. account. Less than she had in her bank account yeah. um, that he had access to. There was no monetary motive for any of this. There were no, not that people knew of, any crosswords or disagreements between them. No. There seemed to be no reason why William would want this. But still, it was him. It's always the husband. Bollocks. The British media agree as well. <laughs> <laughs> they are reporting on this case going, what the fuck? They, the, the media petition for an acquittal. This is, mm. this is nonsense that this man has been, has been found guilty like this at appeal. William's lawyer ripped the prosecution to pieces. Uh, the timetable just does not fit. It is impossible. There is no way he could have physically been in the places he needs to be to commit the crimes that he did. He's been seen in other places. It just doesn't work. The prosecution now changed tack. Uh, they suggest that the Julia Wallace, who had spoken to the milk delivery boy at 6 45, it's not the real Julia Wallace. <laughs> For God's sake. It's not right. her. She was all, Julia Wallace was already dead. And it was a mystery woman. No, it was William Wallace in drag. <laughs> <laughs> Putting on a fancy voice. <laughs> it was him in his wife's clothes. In his wife's clothes. The milk boy did not think anything nope. of this. It was, he was entirely convinced. Who is he to question? Who is he Who to question is he a to man question? standing there in drag? Yeah. I mean, today, do what you want. In the 30s, it was frowned upon. Yeah. Thankfully, the court agree with you on this one. It was probably, it was unlikely to be William in drag they think I mean I kind of wish it was and it was bad <laughs> drag that he had just put on a dress over his suit and he had a beard and everything yeah. and he went out and went I'm Julia <laughs> the appeal works yeah. thank god yeah. the court overturned the conviction the evidence is just not there they actually say the jury got it wrong the jury was wrong on this case. It's one of the first and only times that has ever happened in, in British history that, that a judge has said, you really fucked this up. <laughs> yeah. Normally um, it's, you know, okay, everything that was presented to you, you made yep, the best judgment you made based the best on... Of the evidence you were given. The evidence yes. was faulty. The testimony was faulty. This time it was just, no, you just fucked this up. <laughs> jury were all idiots. Yeah, you're I'm all sorry. idiots. You're persuaded by nonsense. <sighs> William is released. Now, many in Liverpool, um, especially those who had known him, they never believed that William had been responsible for his wife's death. It just was not like him. He had no reason to. He tries to return to his old life, but is never the same again. He is never the same man again. He starts back at the Prudential. But he can't be going door to door now. Everyone is gossiping and whispering. No one, in, people don't invite him in. Friends do fine but new people they've heard whispers they've heard rumors mm. no one asks him in he's not getting a new business his health begins to deteriorate the stress of not earning money not being able to keep up the house his wife's just been brutally murdered no one everyone thinks it's him no one seems to be looking for anyone else yeah. he's not doing well he resigns from his job 
and he moves out of Liverpool. He moves to the Wirral. Ah, uh, the Wirral. The Wirral, a nice little peninsula. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's worth explaining that to yeah. people not from England because that sounds like not here to no. most people. <laughs> it's an area to the west of Liverpool on a little <laughs> peninsula between two rivers. The Wirral. Um, the Wirral. But even there, the rumours and the gossip mm. follow him and it's known. William dies two years later. Wow. Two years after the murder of his wife. Police never identify any other suspects for the murder of Jane Wallace and the case remains unsolved to this day. Oh, good lord, Nick. There we go. Da, da, da. Terrifying. Unsolved mystery. That's very disturbing. Of the murder of Julia Wallace. That is... Yeah, I can't work that out. I mean, some people still think he did it. Oh, there's a little bit of me that wants to pick that apart. Has there been no other suspects? There have been. Later on, not official suspects, not through police channels. This case is is hugely popular. It is... Yeah. M- many people investigate and write books and, and research it. And over the years, there have been other suspects put forward by okay. writers. Uh, P.D. James, she wrote an article in The Guardian about she yes. had solved it. Um, oh. And also a number of other suspects have come to light. And... We are going to have a look at those suspects over on Patreon. We're going to have an episode on who those suspects are. I say no one has ever been charged. No No one has ever been officially found guilty. So we will leave it to, well, I will leave it to Sinead and to to our listeners to discover who they think is the most likely culprit. Was it William Wallace or was it it someone else entirely? We we will never know for sure. Yeah. Oh, good story, Nick. We like an unsolved murder. An unsolved murder. Th- th- we like them, and also they bother me because <laughs> I want to bloody well know. Yeah. I demand answers. Yeah, so it's all just guesswork and people thinking, oh, that would work, and a number of yeah mm. authors and investigators coming up with theories. But did William do it? <laughs> this is ah. what doing a true crime podcast does to you. <laughs> because everything you've laid out there, as a reasonable, rational, innocent human being, I would be going... No, obviously he didn't do it because the timing doesn't match up. But there's also the part of me that's gone, we've done a lot of murders. Yeah. And there's been some weird circumstantial evidence that's been proven right. Yep. The strangest things that you would say couldn't have possibly happened, have happened. People have admitted it later on. So could he, could he have done I it? I mean, I think... Could he have done it? It's a brilliant piece of crime made that call and yeah. then slipped in and slipped out and he timed it perfectly i mean the, the, with with the timings i suppose you've always got to allow for uh, people's recollections because this is obviously only happening a few f- th- days yeah. days afterwards That's a really good point. so even if people are a couple of minutes out if five people are a couple of minutes out then someone's gained 10 minutes mm. type thing so it's oh it was it was around and this is before digital watches and everything. So <laughs> it was around five past seven. Yeah, not everyone's going to have a wristwatch. Not watch. everyone's going to have a wristwatch. It's, oh, I heard the church bells. It must have been around that sort of time. You do your rounds as a milkman. Yeah, it, so oh it's all, God. it's not precise. It's all very about-ish. Was there the possibility that the timings were that a bit vague and a bit not quite as accurate as they have been sometimes portrayed? Mm. That he did, in fact, have that time? The milk boy says, oh, ah, 6.45. Was it more 6.40? That's five minutes. Yeah, had to say the certain <laughs> time because he'd been slacking or something. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, the well, potentially. Two questions. Mm. The bigger question is why. Well, yes, absolutely. But let's, let's come back to that. The second question, maybe related to the why, did he have an accomplice? That is a, that is a, very, good, that is a very good question. I mean, you can be something completely different. You can orchestrate and set up the murder of your wife brilliantly be seen by multiple witnesses mm. but why 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 was she killed why wasn't this just a robbery why not a, just a robbery yeah what did she just interrupt someone yeah was and she then, out was did she, she was she upstairs she was she was poorly she had been in bed she came down she wanted a glass of milk or something or she wanted a she'd gone out for a walk she had yeah. maybe like she maybe not been seen had her had macintosh Mac about to go out interrupted and s- someone and someone stolen the insurance money mm. so is this is that just all is it, it is is it the, is it as simple as that is it simple wrong place wrong time and if the police had not honed in on william yeah. they could have found the killer 
Maybe. If they had stopped just going, it's the husband, that's easy. <laughs> we will discuss some of these possibilities. <laughs> oh. Because there are a few thoughts on such things. Oh, wow. Very famous case, though. Indeed. Very famous case. And, and yes, and used in a lot of legal practice. Ooh, that's interesting. Oh, no. But I, I, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know. God damn it. Maybe he did run that fast. When you were saying earlier on about how he was asking everyone where this street was, I felt like that was the lady doth protest too well much. yeah absolutely he was asking the tram drivers he was asking <laughs> what was he was he there trying to i'm here i'm try, establishing yes holding a pocket watch or a grandfather clock yeah. as he was walking around going yes uh, does anyone know where this a non-existent yeah. road is and that and that is something that came up in the in the in the at the prosecution why he was he he everyone he, he bumped into he was like do you i i'm this person i'm looking for this place do you know where it is do you have the time all yeah. this sort of thing <laughs> so, but then again um, back, back in the day you would but you, you absolutely would. you would you, you would. ask everyone um, it's, it's a it's a scary thing these days to stop someone in the street and ask for directions yeah. back in the day and Nick, you would you absolutely. did it all the time yeah. and other sort of witnesses who came forward like for him said no, he was always very punctual, very punctilious. He he always liked to, liked to know what time it was yeah. with his appointments and his meetings. But he was he always a, a bit watch, of a clock surely. watcher. He had a watch, absolutely. But he was but, asking. Well, he was else. asking people. He was making note of the time. I've got to be somewhere at this time. Because your pocket watch, but, you yeah. have to wind it up. So he was like, Ooh. that was his his nature was to be like that. <laughs> oh, it's perplexing. It's an unsolved mystery, people. What do you think? Do you know the story of William Wallace, the potential murderer, not the Scottish legend, not the Scottish man, <laughs> not the, that guy? Do you have thoughts? Do you have theories about what happened? Please do share them with us and on social media in the chat of anywhere that you listen to this episode we are going to cover some of the suspects over on patreon where we like to delve a bit deeper into some of the cases that we've covered you are welcome to join us over there it is but five dollars a month for deadly nightcaps and it's completely flexible as well but most importantly when we think of this story and the chess pieces <laughs> may be falling into place but apparently not because it's unsolved they're all over the board <laughs> mix yourself up a black and white daiquiri. Oh, dude, it's damn good. I, I mean, that went down very quickly. It went down really well. I can imagine sitting in a garden, slightly Stop autumnal. Stop saying that. Slightly <laughs> autumnal, this one. It's not a, perhaps not a summery drink. It's the end of summer into autumn. I could I'm see this as a that. Christmas drink. I'm really, really happy with that. I like it a lot. It's very nice, and it does make a smile. It does make, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the recipe will be out on Friday. Definitely try and give it a go. It's got a few weird things in. Go and get them. It's great. Mix up that cocktail or any cocktail when you listen to this episode. Please tag us in photos of you enjoying them. Send them to us or tag us on social media. We love to know what you're drinking. Look forward to dissecting some of the potential suspects on Patreon. So if you want to join us on Patreon, please do. It's completely flexible as a platform, but that's the extra Deadly Nightcaps episodes that we do. It's a great time to join. The start of the month means that you get access to all of our back catalogue and every everything that's coming up this month if you are joining the cyanide connoisseurs which is the higher tier you'll also get access to the case files of pc morris a monthly episode looking at the weird and wonderful news from around the world and please leave us a review on apple itunes or wherever you listen to your podcast if you haven't left a review yet take two seconds just to hit the five stars if you think we're worth it and leave a nice comment we would really really appreciate it Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.